Plenty has been said about the Atari Jaguar since it was announced back in 1993, and of course it is the 30th anniversary of the Jaguar here in a few months, but it was initially announced in August of 1993 with a big press conference and all of that. But did you know that there was going to be an Atari Jaguar 2? And it probably would have had a different name had they finalized it, but as things were, there was an actual, what is called the Jaguar 2 prototype that had been developed to a point where, as you can see from this old archived version of uh, from atarimuseum.com, that had a full circuit board, had chips developed for it. It wasn't 100% ready to go, it wasn't 100% finished, but it did exist, as you can see. And so Kurt Vendel is the one who had got his hands on this, and it mentions on that page that it was codenamed Midsummer, and so it would have references to William Shakespeare on there, and uh, so that's where Midsummer comes from, but it had, the, well, the original Jaguar had the Tom and Jerry chipset, and so these for now were also known as Tom 2 and Jerry 2, but again, they probably would have changed something. At one point, the new Tom 2 was so large that it generated heat and needed a cooling fan, and Kurt was able to repair this prototype unit that he found enough to plug in Tempest 2000 and it did actually work. Um, so it was fully backwards compatible, but it, that's all that was made for it. There was no software ever made for it and whatnot. And so that's what I'm going to kind of get into today is what would the Jaguar 2 games might have looked like. And so there is one place we can kind of sort of get an idea from, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the page also shows uh, the connectors that were on there. The Jerry 2, a close up of that. And so, okay, yes, so there actually were other code names given to the Tom and Jerry. And so, in the final release, had it reached that, had the Jaguar not failed miserably in Christmas in 1995, which actually triggered a heart attack for Atari's uh, CEO, Sam Trammell. And then it's likely in 1996, right when the Nintendo 64 was coming out, that this might have hit production, but of course the PlayStation and the Saturn both decimated the Jaguar's chances there. But uh, if we go here to the Jaguar 2, uh, not the schematics, we want to go to the specifications, so let's check those out. Alright, so first I'm going to go over the Jag 2 specs, and then we'll compare it to other systems, at least from what I could figure out might be close to what this is. Of course, it obvious that there's no way to have a one-to-one -one comparison or anything but again we can get kind of close as to where it probably would have looked so we have the resolution we could handle up to 1600 by 600 pixels which is a little bit unusual that would have been a widescreen format I'm not aware of any systems even in the arcades which was aiming for a resolution like that. 32-bit color, you know, 16.7 million colors, of course, and that would likely include transparencies. The original Jaguar could handle transparencies fine, and so wouldn't expect any differently here. And you could handle multiple resolution and multiple color depth objects as well. And did have a cartridge expansion port or slot, and so this was a supposed to be a CD-based system. There was a model called the Jag Duo that was made and floating around there near the end of 1995 and it was considered to be a possible combo of the Jag CD and the Jaguar itself, but it's also very likely that this would have been the case for the Jaguar 2. But getting off on that tangent, uh, the cartridge port for the slot for the original Jaguar I think was 32 bits. It might have been 64, but I want to say 32. And so you have your other standard ports. An interesting note is that this was going to have four controller ports, which uh, the only other Atari system to do that would have been the Atari 5200. Of course, there was the 
Atari 400 as well, but uh, there was the Jaguar Team Tap, which gave the Jaguar itself four or eight potential controller ports, but there's only like one or two games that bothered to use that, and they weren't very good anyways. And then it would have reused the Jaguar's original gamepad because of the backwards compatibility, which in a way is a little bit too bad that it wouldn't be able to do something else, but understandable with, given the backwards compatibility. But now to the more interesting stuff. So the JAG2 would have seven processors, the, and we'll get into all those. Uh, the hardware that was shown on the page before had them nicknamed Tom and Jerry, but they were ultimately supposed to be Oberon and Puck. And as I did some additional reading on this, the prototype boards that have been found, the Oberon would have been the Tom 2, uh, the Puck would have been the Jerry 2, but apparently the Puck chip was never completed as far as the design goes. And so because of that, they used an enhanced Jerry chip, I guess, or it might have been like a prototype of the Puck, but the Puck might have been more powerful than what's listed here. Anyways, the Tom 2 would have been the GPU, just like it was in the original Jaguar. But this one, instead of being a 32-bit RISC one, it, this new one would be a 64-bit RISC architecture, 64 registers of 128 bits wide, and has access to all 2 by 64 bits of the system bus. I don't know if that means that it had some kind of 128 bit system bus or not um, but it could also read 128 bits of data and in one instruction so this seemed to be a 64 slash 128 bit processor hybrid um, but I'll stress as I always try to do that bits do not equal graphics and could get into an entire other video as to that but bits have to do more with speed and how much information is being processed at a one clock cycle or one brief very brief moment in time and so this chip was rated at basically 128 million instructions per second pretty good for 1996 1995 when this was in development and runs at pretty much 64 megahertz which is an interesting little touch, you know, having it be a real 64-bit processor and running at 64 megahertz. Obviously, they were doing that to uh, address the constant criticisms about whether the Jaguar was really a 64-bit system or not. And then uh, two 32 kilobytes of SRAM for cache and mentions wide range of high-speed graphic effects, but who knows exactly what those would be without more details or a tech demo. Just like the original Jaguar, the, the Tom had some sub-processors uh, built into it that were both 64-bit, and one was called the Object Processor, the other was called the Blitter, and it seems to be the same case here. Probably enhanced over where the original Jaguar was. One thing that I've read is that, um, well, I guess stepping back for a second, there was one major bug in the original Jaguar that made it extremely difficult to jump to the main memory from the GPU um, to the point that a lot thought that it wasn't possible. Now, homebrew coders have discovered that it is possible, it's just not very efficient. Um, but that was supposed to have been addressed in the Jaguar 2's design from what I've read. Um, another thing is that the object processor should have had double buffering, a double frame buffer, um, but don't know if that might have been present here since it doesn't mention it. But the object processor, which is essentially responsible for drawing the screen, it could do all sorts of things like it, you see here, sprite engine, pixel map displays, character map displays, etc. And also a blitter that could read and write at the same time, and this one had uh, a read and write buffer. I don't recall seeing that the original Jaguar had anything like that. Um, the original Jag did have hardware support for Z-buffering. It was the first console to do so, as far as I'm aware. And, of course, garage shading. But here's probably the most interesting uh, addition to the Jaguar 2, and that's texture ma the texture mapping engine processor. 
Now, the reason why this is a big deal is that when the original Jaguar was, de was designed, that was about 1990 through 1992, like the spec was completed in the summer of 1992. Now, yes, the system wasn't released until 93, but it took time to debug the hardware, and then, of course, there was manufacturing. Now, in the summer of 1992, there were some arcade games that were starting to push 3D graphics, but they weren't really texture mapped. Most of them were flat shaded polygons, uh, stuff like Virtua Racer, and uh, there were some Taito games do to doing it at the time. But in the summer of 1993, which would have been far too late to change the Jaguar's original hardware design, uh, you had Daytona USA and that had texture mapped 3D polygons screened along at 60 frames a second. And so once that hit, everybody started talking about texture mapped polygons. But again, it was too late for the original JAG hardware to add the proper features to allow it to do fast texture mapping. Now, yes, it could do texture mapping, it's just it was a slower process and uh, it wasn't the greatest but I mean there were some examples like Iron Soldier 2 and Hover Strike on Conquered Lands where you could have some good or decent textures um, without texture warping that was prevalent on the PlayStation um, and the Jaguar could even do MIP map uh, textures and that's what you see in Hover Strike as well but anyways so with the, this processor in the Jaguar 2, it was addressing the fact that the Jaguar that was a weak spot on it. And in fact, I've read developer complaints of people who worked with Atari where constantly uh, Atari was begging them or demanding of them to uh, add temperature map 3D graphics to their games and it's like the hardware is just not capable of doing that <laughs> and so with the Jaguar 2 that would have been different so this would have been a 64-bit RISC processor and fully programmable would have had 256k of RAM so I guess in a way kind of like video RAM and this is where it's interesting is that the claim is that it was capable of doing about 900,000 texture map polygons. Without textures, it can do two and a half million polygons, and it also mentions real time grout and fong shading. Now, without a tech demo or a benchmark demo, we don't know if texture map polygons would have included the shading and the lighting effects, generally speaking, with every system that came out in these times when you added more effects then of course it brought that number that total number down and of course with things like collision detections and um, AI and all that stuff that you need to make a full game usually what was on paper you wouldn't achieve that top limit the Nintendo 64 is a great example of that where theoretically it could do a million polygons but practically it never reached that high and in fact with the different game modes or the uh, rendering modes for the N64 I think it was somewhere around a hundred thousand that was done with full effects there was a mode where you could do 500 to 600 thousand polygons but then the graphics would have looked more like a pl the PlayStation and apparently Nintendo banned developers from even using that and so, uh, yeah, there's lots of little factors that could go into how many polygons that could be done, but still a top, possibly top benchmark of 900,000 texture map polys is pretty good and vastly superior to the original Jaguar, which was said to have been able to do about, I think, 10 to 20,000 polygons, <laughs> not texture map. Uh, in a scene, and that's why the 3D on the Jaguar wasn't very good. Um, but the Jag 2 would have addressed all that. And then there was a fifth processor. This one would be for working with the CD drive, but also providing um, full motion video and things like that, so that you could, uh, again, compete with the PSX, and or at the time they would have been thinking about the 3D OM2 as well. Uh, or even just the 3DO. 
but, uh, and then there was a DRAM memory controller. Um, the RAM, or the DRAM was uh, 64 bits, and as it mentions here at the bottom, the JAG2 would have eight megabytes of fast page mode DRAM, and so an eight megabyte system would have made it, uh, given it more memory, well, quite a bit more memory than the PlayStation, than the Saturn, than the, and, the base Nintendo 64. Of course, there was the expansion pack later on, um, but that would have given it a distinct advantage there. And then we get to the Jerry processor, which again, I'm not sure if this is supposed to have been the Puck spec. I mean, this is certainly higher spec than the Jerry chip that appeared in the original Jaguar, um, but hard to say. But if this was what the Puck's final spec was going to be. Uh, this says, uh, I mean, it was a digital signal processor, so its main thing was to handle sound audio stuff and uh, other things with, related to DSPs. But main thing was, of course, sound and full stereo capabilities, and you could do wavetable FM, FM sample synthesis, AM synthesis, and uh, you had a wart in chip in there. The Jaguar's wart chip actually had a bug that was a little difficult to work around and so that's why uh, Doom crashes a lot when you're trying to network it. And then the last but not least processor in the Jaguar 2 would have been the Motorola 68EC020 uh, which would run, run at 26 megahertz and had the perfect 68000 emulation for the backwards compatibility and now with the Motorola 68020 um, this was used in various arcade machines and so like Primal Rage is one game that used it um, there was also Moto Frenzy um, but of course the graphics of Primal Rage or Moto Frenzy or T-Mac uh, those wouldn't that's not what the Jaguar 2 would have looked like but that was uh, one of the main processors there and also the um, Kojag hardware which was the Jaguar console modified to work in arcades it came with a 68020 uh, it all, that one also came with four megabytes of RAM and so would the Jaguar 2 have been looked better than what Area 51 did absolutely you know, all the specs are higher there but of course, now we have to wonder, so on paper, this all sounds great. Uh, assuming that this system would have came out in 1996, maybe worst case scenario 1997, if uh, depending on how things had worked out, but I would guess 96 to compete directly with the N64. Um, but how does it stack up against other systems? And so here on SegaRetro.org, we have a few specs from other contemporary systems at that time. Uh, you have the PlayStation and N64, Saturn, Sega Model 2, and then PC. And from what I can tell, and looking here, and also looking at the Sega Model 2 spec on System 16, it seems like the Jaguar 2 would have fit closer to the Sega Model 2 arcade hardware, um, which came out in 1993, but was still way ahead of other consoles. And so as you can see just from the specs, uh, like the MIPS or MOPS, whatever you want to call it, millions of instructions per second, um, you had the Sega Model 2 were running at 210, the N64 190, the PSX 66. Going back to the Jaguar 2, um, it's a little hard to say what the overall uh, MOPS or MIPS would have been because the TOM had uh, basically 128, but then it mentions Jerry having 53.3, and so I don't know if you could combine both together. It might have depended on the bus. That's one thing that I noticed. Is, okay, I guess we do have something about the bus here. So there was a 64-bit data bus rated at 2400 megabits per second. Um, not sure why it mentions the 6800. Maybe it meant to say the 68020 there instead. Uh, but yeah, so the Jaguar 
two might have had somewhere close to 200 million in there not sure so that might have put it in uh, the same realm as the n64 but again that's just one factor not all of them is there's lots of differences with each of these systems and as to what they could handle but of course one of the things that uh, is often touted is are how many polygons per second could be done at least theoretically you know with the saturn saying like 700,000 using ground lighting ground shading uh, the PlayStation 360,000 polygons, the N64 uh, 1 million, the Model 2 1.5 million, but then you get down here to other uh, settings with different color rates and all that, flat shading, grout shading, texture mapping, and then texture mapping depending on how many colors, and you can see that the numbers are just kind of all over the place. And so it looks to me like texture mapped with uh, grout shading might be one of the things to look at that uh, the PlayStation could you know, do a decent amount there but the Model 2 could do 300,000 it does say half a million for the N64 but again that was using a mode that Nintendo did not allow developers to use um, I'm not sure if any homebrews out there have tried to use it and see what you get out of it um, but with the Jaguar 2, as far as we know, 900,000 texture map polygons. But again, don't know if that was with effects or not. Um, but without texture mapping, 2.5 million is still pretty good. And then display resolutions, you know, most of them are in the realm of 640 by 480, but everyone had kind of strange <laughs> settings, and as would the Jaguar 2 running at 1600 by 600 uh, or maximum obviously it could have handled non widescreen uh, resolutions probably would have done something more like 640 by 480 I would imagine uh, most of the time but uh, just another interesting little thing there and of course you had your different amounts of RAM in place there and so comparatively the best I can figure is that the Jaguar 2 again might have been somewhat comparable to Sega's Model 2 and to give you an idea of what games ran on that hardware um, and this is using system16.com uh, you had stuff like Dead or Alive uh, also known as Dynamite Cop or sorry Dead or Alive was here that was a fighting game and then you had Dynamite Cop which was uh, an enhanced version of Die Hard Arcade uh, Manix TT Superbikes, Motor Raid um, never saw Pilot Kids. Sega Rally, um, which I'm pretty sure that was on the Saturn, um, but maybe the Jaguar 2 could have handled it even better. Sky Target, Virtua Cop 2, Virtua Fighter 2. I actually have that arcade machine. I need to fix the monitor on that one. And Zero Gunner, uh, that wasn't the only Model 2, though. There was three variations in the Model 2, um, but I don't think that the uh, 3D graphics changed all that much uh, between the different versions. I think it might have been more uh, certain other changes like RAM and stuff. Um, but yeah, Dynamite or Did, Al Did Our Live is mentioned again. Uh, Gunblade NY is another one. Uh, of course, I one thing that I would imagine is that uh, the transparency effects of the Jaguar 2 probably would have been better <laughs> than what Model 2 did. Model 2 used a weird uh, checkerboard effect uh, which a lot of those uh, Sega models would use and that was always a little strange to see but um, yeah, and then the most powerful out of the uh, Model 2 ones behind enemy lines which is a 3D uh, light gun game and we had Indy 500 over Rev. And so this gives you an idea. I'll put up some video here. Oh, House of the Dead. Uh, the original House of the Dead was a Model 2 game as well. So, I mean, again, we won't know for sure unless somebody is able to get their hands on the Jaguar 2. 
hardware and create something for it or do an FPGA and then be able to create tools so that people can create at least maybe tech demos. Um, but another thing that I would, should also bring up is that in looking at the 3DO M2 spec, it also seems like the Jaguar 2 was similar to that and there's been a lot of stuff popping up about the M2 in recent times as there have been some tech demos there was an arcade board that used the M2 hardware that uh, was done by Konami uh, but in looking at the specs there are some similarities such as the RAM would have been the same and it mentions doing texture mapped uh, polygons this claimed to do up to a million per second um, that are texture mapped and so that would be pretty close to the Jaguar 2 and then here's the uh, Konami M2 which again did use that same base although looking at this page the specs are a little bit different than this other page that I looked at where it says that uh, 1 million untextured triangles per second geometry rate reportedly 700,000 texture polygons without crowd shading or additional effects but then if you added on all those effects then it could be 300 to 500,000 um, but still there are some actual arcade games that were released using the M2 hardware and such as Battle Trist and Evil Knight, Heat of Eleven, Polystars, Total Vice and so these all should give us a rough idea of what the Jaguar 2 probably would have looked like. Um, and then last but not least, use, to use that phrase once again, uh, one that I'll throw in here is there was a commercially released chip from the same people who designed the Jaguar and the Jaguar 2 and that was known as the Nuon. Now the Nuon was originally called Project X and once Atari basically went out of business and reverse mergered with a hard drive company uh, some of the people from Atari went on to create VM Labs and their idea was to essentially do the same thing with the th that the 3DO did but with DVDs instead of video CDs since video CDs were a total flop and so but when that first came out I remember being on Atari forums like Atari Interactive and that first popping up it was called Project X and we all got really excited about it because when it was first announced they were talking about Tempest 3000, Iron Soldier 3 and so you were having these Atari Jaguar games uh, showing up for this new hardware that was coming from a bunch of X Atari guys and as well as the hardware itself being designed by these uh, the same team who had worked on the original Jaguar and so in essence the new one is basically the Jaguar 2 and as you see here this is Iron Soldier 3 and giving you a good idea of, of what the best is that we know of from the new one now of course the new one didn't really get um, a lot of time on the market that only had six released games and so we never got to really see the full potential of the new one but of course to be fair and concise the hardware architecture the specs uh, between the new one and the Jaguar 2 are entirely different so the new one it's one chip although it's essentially like an early quad core processor and it was all 128 bits um, it did have 8 megabytes of RAM uh, but I'm not aware of how many polygons it was able to handle but one weird thing about the new one is that it didn't have hardware support for pretty much anything and so whereas the Jaguar 2 would have had hardware support for garage shading and Z buffering and texture mapping and things like that the new one did not and so everything that you could do on the new one was done in software and what was unique about it though was that it ran at 54 megahertz which also was slower than the Jaguar 2 but it was a, being a 128 bit processor with these four essentially like cores uh, I don't think they were separate 
court. I can't remember the exact setup, but it was something along those lines. It was a weird architecture, um, but it had, a, I want to say, 1500 MIPS, and so it would have been quite a bit more powerful than the any of those consoles that I mentioned previously as far as the millions of instructions per second went. It's just, again, you had to do everything in software. And now that did give developers flexibility, so that's where on the Nuon chip you could do real-time ray tracing, you could do voxels, uh, you could do polygons with texture mapping, you could do sprites, you could do basically whatever it is you, you wanted to. It's just there was no hardware support for it, so you had to be a really, really good coder to get the most out of it, and that made it a very difficult processor to code for um, but again since it was a commercial failure and we only got six games we we'll, we never got to see what its full maxed out potential was but again in spirit it's essentially the Jaguar 2 <laughs> just because of all those behind the scenes connections and so maybe the Jaguar 2 games would have looked like this or I had Iron Soldier 3 popped up on the Jaguar, which it probably would have had the Jag 2 been released, then I'm sure it would have looked pretty close to this. Um, don't know if it would have looked better or worse, who knows, but, you know, probably pretty close. Well, um, to end this off, um, had the Jaguar 2 been released, what do you think Atari would have called it? I doubt they would have called it the Jaguar 2. They probably would have called it something else, but given that they were using cat names, or giant cat names, would it have been the lion, the tiger, <laughs> the puma, the cougar? Who knows? So let me know what you think in the comments below. Which cat name do you think should have been for Atari's next system? But anyways, that's our best guess at what the Jaguar 2 might have ended up being. And let me know your thoughts on that below, and we'll see you on the next video.